Well, good evening, everyone. And it's a real honour to be invited to speak um, about the work that we do at Rosalind Chapel. I'm going to spend some time uh, speaking a little bit about my background and my vision for my spiritual community um, and give a few tips about morning services and then move on to the other things that we do. Uh, monthly Sunday evening groups, online courses, Sunday afternoon workshops, uh, community outreach, interfaith work, life events and finish up with a little more advice at the end. I want to start by saying my, my watchword, my key phrase is progress not perfection. Um, only God is perfect uh, but we've got to um, give things a go and, and see um, see if we can um, experiment a little sometimes. So I encourage you to stretch yourself um, and, and try a few new things. Also, I should say that um, I recognise that ours is a, one of the larger congregations in our Unitarian movement, um, and I'm building on what was already established. Uh, before I became the minister here, uh, there was always a morning and evening service, there were various other activities, um, and we are blessed with a, um, a number of uh, active volunteers and, uh, and, and some other staff, so I recognise that um, our situation can be quite different to some of the other um, smaller Unitarian congregations. And also what works for us isn't necessarily going to uh, suit everyone, uh, but I'm just offering these as ideas for inspiration. Everyone has been impacted by the pandemic and for me personally um, I was just coming back from maternity leave. Uh, my baby son was four months old as I was starting some part-time work. Um, my first weekend um, back was uh, leading a service, a memorial service and um, an AGM and then straight into lockdown. So it was quite a shock to the system in many different ways but we went directly online um, and, uh, and now the chapel has its own YouTube channel um, and we stream our morning services each week as well as being in person. So I thought I would give a little of my, uh, my Unitarian origin story. I know some of you will have heard this, but uh, just for the record, um, I came from a very non-religious background growing up in a village in Somerset. Uh, I went to a Church of England primary school uh, but also surrounded by a lot of um, new age practices, being quite close to Glastonbury, um, some pagan rituals, so quite comfortable with that side of things. Um, uh, when I wasn't christened, my mum want, wanted me to choose my own religion. Uh, so when I was 10, I thought, well, I ought to choose, choose a religion. I did a little bit of DIY research at the library, as you do when you're 10, um, quite liked Hinduism, settled on Buddhism and became a vegetarian. Decades ago, back when um, being a vegetarian meant that you couldn't buy shop-bought biscuits because they had animal fat in them, all of them. And I just got sick of people saying to me, oh, you can't eat those biscuits if you're a Buddhist. Um, and so I'm afraid I had to make the decision between biscuits and Buddhism and aged 11 by then, um, the biscuits won out. So I then carried on with my studies. I ended up with a, a degree in three-dimensional design, product design. My first job was with a toy company and then eventually moved into the third sector, um, working with various charities, but still doing some creative work on the side. Um, and I was attending a friend's um, very Christian wedding, a wonderful, joyful occasion. Um, and I, um, I loved that sense of community, but I knew that that particular signing up to one particular theology was not right for me. And I was working in Hampstead at the time and a work colleague suggested that I go to that Unitarian chapel up the road, try that one. Uh, she said a friend um, tried it and said they were very friendly, but it was not quite Christian enough for her. And I thought, hmm, that sounds intriguing. And when I went, uh, it was Palm Sunday, the choir was singing, uh, the minister spoke about Jesus being a great leader and a great teacher, but not necessarily the son of God, unless we are all sons and daughters of God, the God of our understanding. 
and that just struck a chord with me. My mother and my grandmother always spoke about Jesus being a great example of a human being. Um, so I am probably one of those people who, who was Unitarian my whole life, uh, but didn't know that that's what it was called. Um, I became very involved with the community and started to lead services. Um, and eventually I was persuaded to apply for ministry training. So I went off to Oxford and also um, did an, a master's degree in Abrahamic religions at a London college. Um, and then I was minister for Lewisham Unitarians um, and then eventually came back to Roslyn Hill Chapel to be their settled minister um, nearly six years ago now. So my, uh, my vision for my spiritual community, I suppose, is um, encapsulated in the way that we describe Roslyn Hill Chapel being a spiritual home for open minds and that it's a place for people to explore their spiritual path. Um, you might say with like-minded people, but there are plenty of, of differing views here, um, but with people who are going to respect those differences. And this goes beyond our morning, our Sunday morning services to all of the different events. Um, so I am actually going to speak briefly about su Sunday mornings, just a few tips um, before I go on to other things. Uh, I mentioned my master's degree, I did a dissertation on funeral practices in Christianity and Judaism and how they've changed over the years. And while I won't bore you with all of the details, uh, my final conclusion is that modern funerals, and I would then extend this to any um, spiritual ceremonies, should have something personal and something familiar. So something that people are going to be able to take away with them and reflect on and apply in their personal life, but also something familiar. So in the context of um, funerals that might be that they want to have all things bright and beautiful or they want to have um, the Lord's Prayer said even if they are not themselves particularly religious. So I would suggest that if you're conducting a, a, a Sunday morning service or, or any kind of ceremony to just have that in mind and I try to do that when I'm creating worship services. Also a chance to get the congregation involved in the service. We do this traditionally by suggesting that people give readings, but there are other ways to do it. Um, we have a greeting quite early on in our service uh, where you turn to someone near you, you say your, your name and welcome them to chapel. Um, and this means that if they don't speak to anyone else, if they scuttle out after the service, at least they've spoken to one person. We also have some services where we turn and talk, so I might in introduce um, a subject for reflection, we might have a guided meditation, and then you turn to someone near you um, and, and have a bit of a chat. Um, so I think there are a, a few different ways to encourage more participation. Um, and I just want to mention here um, The Shared Pulpit, which is a book by the Unitarian Universalist uh, Minister Erica Hewitt. She was at our GA annual meetings um, and I am hoping to um, put on a, a group which will be an online course working through that book, The Shared Pulpit, in the autumn. And so you're, if you're interested in being involved then do contact me. It's an eight-week course to build up from writing a tiny bit of uh, a reflection to a full sermon um, over that time. So starting with writing, I don't know, one minute or three minutes and then building up from there. So moving on to um, monthly Sunday evening groups. Uh, we've always had an evening service or evening gathering, um, but now I've slightly rearranged it. So there's, there are, are, are kind of regular things that go on um, each month. Uh, so the first Sunday of the month is Soul Fuel, uh, which is our acoustic music and poetry and storytelling gathering. Um, and so we have a couple of singer songwriters um, who come along and also members of our poetry group who share um, poems on uh, the monthly theme. We have monthly themes um, for our services and events. The second, so, uh, the second Sunday is um, some kind of alternative um, 
meditation. So you can see a photo there of um, a sound bath and we'll hear a short video of it later on in this presentation. Um, so a sound bath is um, an opportunity to lie on the floor and be washed away in sound. Um, we have a sound therapist who comes in and plays Tibetan singing bowls and gongs um, and it's brought in a whole uh, new demographic, I would say, of people who haven't necessarily heard about Unitarianism. And we alternate that uh, with a labyrinth uh, walking meditation. So you'll see the, the lower photo shows that. It's a canvas a replica of Chartres Cathedral, which fills the whole of our chapel. And it takes about 40 minutes to walk all the way in and all the way out again. And we're very grateful to have um, three interfaith ministers who bring this canvas once every two months um, so that we can have the labyrinth walk. The third Sunday tends to be a reprise of um, our morning service, but with some opportunity for people to share their own reflections. So it'll be a shorter version of the sermon, perhaps. We don't have hymns, it's much more meditative. Um, I'll lead people in a guided meditation and then they can um, actually speak and share their, um, their views and their reflections on what has been said. And then finally, the fourth uh, Sunday is usually music and meditation, uh, which is um, a, a combination of different forms of meditation, spoken, silent, um, walking meditation, guided, a, a body prayer. Um, and this is interspersed with beautiful uh, classical piano music from our director of music. And we're very lucky to have a, a wonderful Steinway um, concert grand piano. So um, it really does make for a special evening. And then every six weeks or so, uh, we have the Wheel of the Year, which has been running for, for decades in this chapel, uh, which is an opportunity to, to honour the seasons with the eight um, festivals, the main ones being summer solstice um, and winter solstice, but then all the cross quarter days um, and the equinoxes. Uh, so we do that uh, with some ritual, uh, a slightly different format, again, as much participation as possible. Um, and and I, I really, I really um, appreciate uh, the fact that, that it's continued and, um, and that we can recognize the, the turning of the wheel and the changing of the se seasons in this way. Then on to um, our spiritual development courses and our workshops. Um, oh no, first, I think we have a, a little taster of um, one of the Sunday evening gatherings. Uh, this is um, this is Soul Fuel. It's just um, a little bit of a couple of our um, musicians. So I think I should be able to uh, share this myself. We'll go on to the um, spiritual development courses and workshops. So this really started, the online element started during lockdown and um, throughout the pandemic. I've been putting on spiritual development courses of various types um, uh, for the last few years, uh, usually six to eight weeks on a Tuesday evening, for example, in the chapel. Um, either working through a book or um, doing Soul, um, Soul Deep, which is my own uh, creation, a kind of engagement group. Um, and then when we went online, I realised that uh, there was a great need for connection beyond uh, the Sunday service. And we weren't doing evening services at that point as well. And actually, it worked so well on Zoom uh, that we've continued with that uh, practice of having spiritual development courses online and then to 
balance that because it's so important for people to come together physically as well. Uh, we have uh, monthly in-person workshops on a Sunday afternoon. So the online, uh, the online courses, again, very convenient for people to be in their cosy living rooms rather than in a drafty chapel um, on a November Tuesday evening. Um, I mentioned Soul Deep. Uh, we also have worked through various books such as The, Li the Listening Path by the um, creative, creativity guru, uh, Julia Cameron. Also, Me and White Supremacy by Leila Said, which I thoroughly recommend, very challenging um, book, but definitely worth um, doing um, and possibly in a group. Um, and then most recently, during the Lent period, we had Hearing God in Poetry, an anthology of poems, which was compiled by Richard Harris and has a short kind of commentary as well as the poem uh, that really struck a chord with people. In future, we hope to have more of our Soul Deep um, groups. And as I mentioned, the Shared Pulpit by Erica Hewitt, um, working through that book in the autumn. The Sunday afternoon workshops have been all kinds of different subjects. Um, I did one on spiritual, spiritual creative writing, which I'm going to reprise at the London District uh, quarterly meeting, if you're um, going to be coming to that. Uh, later on in the autumn um, that will be at the chapel and I've also got a kind of session plan if you'd like to run this as a two-hour workshop in your congregation please contact me uh, it's a series of very short simple writing exercises and then people can share um, however much they feel comfortable with in smaller groups and it really uh, did have some great positive feedback we also did a workshop on family history and bringing that to life. I did that with a cultural historian and most recently an educational psychologist came to speak to us about positive psychology and learning from our past stories and life experience to give us strength and build resilience in the future. And in September we'll have someone coming to speak to us on conflict management. So that's uh, coming up in the autumn. Then on to community outreach. There are a few different ways that we do this. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, a couple of them. Death Cafe, you may have come across, has been a movement for many years, uh, usually in secular settings. And during lockdown, many of the Death Cafes either um, closed completely or they went online and not many of them have come back to being in person. It's an opportunity for people to come together and speak about end of life matters over tea and cake. So trying to take the taboo out of talking about death. And we found that there's been a really great need and a great response uh, when we put them on. Originally I put it on, I used to just do them once a year around October time. And when I did it last October, everyone was like, when is the next one? So um, some volunteers came forward to help me run it monthly. So we do it on the last Sunday of the month now. We also are uh, reconnecting with Channing School in Highgate, uh, which was originally established to educate the daughters of Unitarian ministers and so, so still has a very strong Unitarian ethos. Um, and the picture, the, um, the lower picture with the two hands is a design for um, a prize plate uh, because we introduced the Rosalind Hill Chapel Award last year uh, to honour those girls in the junior school and the, and the senior school who had demonstrated Unitarian values of open minds, loving hearts, helping hands. Um, and that plate design was the winning one um, from a design competition and ha now has been made into a plate that is presented to the winner of the, um, of the junior award. And then finally, uh, the Saturday Club for Toddlers. Um, this is, was again born out of my, um, my noticing a need, uh, specifically the need for um, something on the weekends for uh, families with young children. I noticed all of the baby classes seem to be during the week. So those people who work during the week, um, not just dads, 
working parents in general um, didn't have many opportunities to meet other parents and to see their children interact with children of the same age and so I started that on the first Saturday of the month um, and I should say I have my own toddler so um, it wasn't just completely altruistic um, I was uh, I, I, I saw that need and I felt that need myself so this is the Saturday Club, the first uh, Saturday of the month, and we hopefully you can see in that photo we have a circle of chairs with some um, baby mats in the middle and uh, some toys. It's really free form play, so uh, we don't we're not sort of very strict about what they do. Uh, then we go on to um, offering them some healthy snacks in our side aisle and offering tea and coffee to the parents and then we finish up with some music and bubbles so uh, we're lucky to have uh, one of our members who plays ukulele and so she usually comes along and plays some nursery rhymes and then we have a bubble machine uh, which is a real highlight for the kids as well. One, two, special action. Yes, we've um, we've had a, um, we've been involved with the Cold Weather Shelter, which is a, um, a project, a network of of churches and chapels in our um, in our lo local area for over ten years now, um, and uh, we we set up this um, temporary shelter on a Friday night. Uh, sitting down, preparing dinner and eating with the guests um, and then they stay overnight uh, with a couple of our volunteers and then in the morning more volunteers come in and prepare breakfast. During the pandemic that model was not um, possible and so the guests were staying in a, a low-cost hotel, a kind of more of a hostel um, situation but it um, it isn't sustainable to do it in that way um, and so we've just heard that we'll be going back to the previous model um, of, um, of offering the cold weather shelter on a Friday. Uh, it, it is quite um, a big commitment for us but we are happy to do it and we'll be um, over the next couple of months um, organising ourselves, reorganising ourselves uh, to offer that again beginning in November. We also have a monthly good cause uh, so we divide our collection plate between the upkeep of the chapel and um, our a chosen charity and we try to cycle through and vary between having a local, a national and an international charity. And in past years we've also invited someone from that charity to come and speak to us um, to just kind of um, give a, a better picture of, of um, the work that they're doing. Another part of our social action is um, our commitment to Black Lives Matter and to raising up the voices of, the, of people of colour. And one aspect of that is celebrating Black Lives. So in our notice board, we have uh, proudly displayed, we believe Black Lives Matter. And then each month we highlight a different significant person um, who um, just as a, as a with a short bio, biography um, and a photo to try and redress the historic imbalance of um, representation. Uh, it's our, our, our tiny, our small um, offering in that, in that regard. And there you can see a photo of Mag Maggie Adarin Pocock, who you may know of as a, a wonderful um, broadcaster and astronomer. Moving on to interfaith and ecumenical groups. Uh, so we're part of Churches Together in Hampstead. You may know that we're not necessarily welcome as Churches Together in Great Britain, um, but at the local level, we're very much part of that group. Um, and we do things like hosting the all weather picnic, um, which brings together the different churches in the area. We've also had a couple of fundraisers, a quiz, um, for the last couple of years, I think we had one last year, um, and the photo you can see there is a wonderful family Kaylee uh, that was put on a couple of weeks ago, raising money for um, a, a local neighbourhood charity called The Winch, which was great fun and also uh, raised a good amount of money. I'm also involved with the Faith Leaders Forum, which is organised by the local borough council, and it's really um, an opportunity for the 
for the council to let us know information that's relevant to us as, as religious leaders and also to get our feedback on various issues. Then I've put, I've put life events and pastoral care together. You won't be surprised that I'm mentioning pastoral care because it's very much a part of, um, a, part of a minister's role. I think also there's a, very much a pastoral element to conducting weddings, namings, and especially funerals. And I'm reminded of my colleague Danny Crosby's words that we as ministers are a guest in other people's lives. And, um, and we have to, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a great honor to be in that position. Um, and we have to respect that. Uh, the photo there is actually a gathering uh, for Santa Duinwin's day, uh, which we did or wedding special, where we invited couples who'd been married in the chapel um, to come back and some of them read readings that were from their own wedding. Uh, we had one of our authorised people talking about her experience as a registrar and it was a really joyful occasion and hopefully we'll have that um, each year as, um, as a way to celebrate um, those those weddings. Um, I just, I suppose, want to take this opportunity to encourage more congregations to consider um, rites of passage, life events, and especially weddings. Uh, we're very proud of the number of same-sex weddings we um, conduct. It was shocking to me to find that of the couple of hundred churches in our borough who are registered for registered to conduct marriages, only four of them are registered to conduct same-sex weddings. And that is in this multicultural, liberal, open-minded borough of Camden in London. So um, we, we Unitarians are doing something really special um, and I think more congregations uh, could step up to that. We're currently about 50-50 in terms of the number of same-sex weddings and the number of opposite sex weddings we conduct. Um, and I just want to hold up Melda Grantham's role with the GA because if you are considering trying to do more weddings or, or starting for the first time, it's, it's a lovely experience um, and Melda can, uh, can really give you some advice about that. And of course, also the Unitarian College run a, a range of courses, including rites of passage courses. Uh, so um, do consider um, training if, if that feels like something you'd like to do. So uh, I think that's my very brief run through of the various things that we do at the chapel. Uh, and I just wanted to finish up with a few pieces of advice, if you'd permit me um, to make a few suggestions um, based on my experience over the past few years. One, the, the most important, I suppose, to think about is don't think about in terms of things of, in terms of how can we get more people to come to our services, especially how can we get people, more people to come to our Sunday morning services. Sunday morning might not be the best time for people. And we've certainly found that people have got out of their rhythms during the pandemic. They may be doing other things on a Sunday morning. So do consider other times when you might be able to put on events and also think in terms of what do people in my area really need and how can we support them to get it. And I gave that example of the Death Cafe, which is a very simple thing to, to, to put on and, and seems to really have some impact. And also the toddler group in my particular situation seem to be um, a need. This may seem at odds with what I've just said, but you also have to think of ways of encouraging more people through the door. I think of it in terms of a kind of a funnel of the, the people coming through. Some of them may come to an event and then consider returning to another event and then getting more um, involved. But you have to start with quite a wide funnel of people in order to get that core who are going to really be involved with your community. Um, and also recognising that 
it may be that Death Cafe is the one thing that they want to do and, and to be okay with that. It may be that the meditation group that you put on is the one thing that they want to do. They are still part of your spiritual community, even if they're not coming on a Sunday morning. The next suggestion is to collaborate rather than reinventing the wheel. I know this is not a new idea, but uh, there are all kinds of resources, uh, ways that you can find out what other people are doing, searching in your local area for um, charities and other groups who are doing something similar to you that you'd like to get involved with, but also make use of Lizzie and all of the connections she's building up, find out what's happening through Facebook groups, um, and you know, local, the local volunteer centre may well have information um, that might help. And um, those of you who went to the, the GA meetings will have heard Indra Adnan's um, keynote speech. And the key point that I took from it was how lucky we are not every, to have buildings, not every congregation has a physical space, um, but if we have physical spaces, uh, to make the most of them, uh, to make them a space where people can come together and to connect, because I tell you, now more than ever, ever, people are thirsty, they're yearning to, to reconnect after the pandemic, um, and we should be offering those spaces for them to do that. And finally, get good at communications, because there really is no point in offering an event if people don't know about it. Uh, we have a wonderful press officer in Rory, and I'm sure he, um, he'll have plenty of, of suggestions for you. I worked with him and Joe James on the GA communication session at, at the annual meetings. Um, and I have put together a, a handout based on it um, with a few of my own tips again, based on my experience. Um, so if you're interested in that, then, um, then let me know or let Lizzie know and, and we can get that out to you. The key thing I think is to be ready for those people who come through the doors, have something to hand to them, know what you're going to say to them. Uh, we are very lucky to be in a, in a position where there, we, we have a lot of footfall, lots of people passing by, if our doors are open, people wandering in, um, if I'm there or someone else who's sensible is there, we'll talk to them about um, what's a Unitarian. Um, and quite often they are visitors, they're tourists to the area and they live in another part of the country or another part of London. And I'd love to know that when I encourage them to visit their local congregation wherever they live, that you are ready for them uh, when they come through your doors. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I just wanted to end with a short video of the sound bath to let those words settle.